Hello, hello. And welcome again to a Beatles talk show podcast, which is called Things We Said Today. This is a show that happens, in most cases, bi-weekly. And we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, the future, their history, their music, anything we feel like talking about, we discuss here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the regular co-hosts of this show, known for my syndicated Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing. Also for another talk show podcast on the solo Beatles, which is called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts on the show. First of all, a man who for many years worked at the New York Times in their classical department, wrote many great articles on classical music through the years for them, as well as having written a few Beatle books, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, and also Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken, and hello, everyone. And also, we happen to have Darren DeVivo, who for almost 40 years has been a mainstay in New York radio at uh, WFUV. And you may have noticed that we've been kind of like absent (laughs) for uh, more than two weeks. It seems like almost a month. And that's because Darren, unfortunately, came down with the coronavirus. And we wanted to wait until he was ready, willing, and able, and was as close to 100% uh, healthy for him to come back to the show. And we're happy to say that Darren is back. And I don't know about better than ever, but I'm back. <laughs> How's back it going, Darren? So it's actually been a rather uh, trying month because uh, a week before Christmas, I actually had what I thought was just a nasty case of indigestion. Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, what did I say? It was, it was exactly a week before Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, thank you. I thought I had a nasty case, and it's happened to me before in the past, very infrequently. But, you know, bad indigestion, chest pains. Many, many years ago, I thought I was having a heart attack, and it was turned out it was, a, a, you know, a pan- pancreatitis attack. They found gallstones. So, you know, we're going to have the gallbladder removed, and then, boom, COVID arrived. And uh, the whole gallbladder thing got pushed to the side. And uh, so I've been out of commission with coronavirus, the Rona, as I was calling it. And it definitely um, is a very strange virus that it sometimes is is no different than maybe having the flu. But it, yet at the same time, you feel these strange symptoms that come and go that have nothing to do with each other and then you realize, wait a minute, I've had a low grade fever for a week now. That's never happened before, you know, so it really messes your head up and taps you with energy and you just don't feel like doing stuff. And as a result of that, you know, I kept I took I took a ended up taking a few weeks off from WFUV, which was even extended because I had actually taken the Thanksgiving week off before I got sick. Then I got sick. You know, I had already put in for Christmas, the Christmas break, the two weeks here off. So it's like I've only really been on the radio for, I think, five, five times over the past five weeks or so and won't be back till early January. But the Rona is uh, fading off. They say I have antibodies now. So I guess that's good. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, we march on. And just when you thought 2020 threw every curveball at you, it could. It it finds another one. Sure. And your whole family had it. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. We we shared it. It was nice. Um, (laughs) My son. I don't know if you'd call it nice. uh, (laughs) Very cool the way we share things in this house. Here, Dad. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) And then my my wife got sick and my daughter got sick. But the kids, you know, they're in their late teens, early 20s. It seems like they bounced back in a couple of hours. I mean, it was a few days. My wife and I were like dragging on the floor and, you know, the, we were getting last rites and it was uh, it was much longer, prolonged, weird symptoms, pain, everything, loss of smell. I was getting pains in my hands when I would pick things up. Very bizarre. And a few that I was told before we started recording the show, please, Darren, don't tell them about that. 
it's disgusting. <laughs> so, uh, but um, I'm alive and almost well and ready to wrap up the year. And and uh, McCartney three came at the right time to kind of as I was coming out of my rut. There it was. But more on that later. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're certainly glad that you are back, and certainly for uh, McCartney three. And we had also planned on doing a show on Double Fantasy for its 40th anniversary for something that important. We wanted to wait till you were ready. And um, when it comes to John, because we also know that there's going to be a Plastic Ono Band box set coming out, we're going to do a special on that. There will be other Lennon specials that we'll be doing fairly soon. But we also right. thought since McCartney 3 just came out, it's all new music, it's something to celebrate, um, that we would make that our next show and that will be our main topic but as usual we have a lot of news to get to here and since we haven't done a show for about a month quite a lot has accumulated and just from the past weekend <laughs> alone between McCartney 3 coming out a new Ringo song uh, a major passing uh, in the world of music and also the big news about this uh, teaser video that uh, we were treated to. It came out, I think, Sunday night, which will lead off our news. This has been a whirlwind, uh, uh, you know, a roller coaster this past weekend, certainly for me, uh, of, of mixed emotions, exhilaration on one hand, and then sad news of a major passing, which we'll talk about. And uh, But we'll start by talking about this brand new film that we were treated to that I'm sure everybody listening to this program has now seen. This is for the upcoming Get Back film and um, it had an introduction from the director Peter Jackson explaining how the pandemic caused a delay for its release and they had to continue working on it in New Zealand where uh, the pandemic is, is under control. And after that, they presented a montage, which was about four minutes long, taken from the film uh, of the Beatles having fun, clowning around and uh, rehearsing the songs Get Back and Two of Us. And this was a real joy for, I think, every Beatle fan to watch of what's to come. Picture quality was just absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your take on, uh, on this teaser. Starting with you, Alan. Yeah, I mean, like you say, uh, the quality was spectacular, um, which, I mean, even if they were just to do the old Let It Be movie as it was, but in that quality, that would be a huge improvement. But, um, you know, this is uh, seemingly intended to show a completely different side of the Let It Be sessions than than we had seen. Although, you know, those of us who have listened to all the bootlegs and the uh, the Nagra reels know that there were plenty of times when they were having fun. And when, you know, John, for instance, was being, you know, uproariously funny uh, and everybody was into it. So, you know, in a way, uh, everybody is taking this sort of reductive idea that, um, oh, well, the Let It Be film made it seem like they just had the most horrible time and couldn't stand each other, which is actually not true if you go back and watch the Let It Be film. That has some fun in it, too, you know? Mm. And that, you know, now Apple is showing us this other side and are they revising history and, you know, history and, well, not even history, but just reality is nuanced. Uh, it's, 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 you know, don't people understand that? You know, I mean, surely, you know, it's clear, you know, you, you spend a month doing recording sessions for an album, you're going to have good times and you're going to have fights. And in mm -hmm. the Beatles case, there were other things going on that were, uh, you know, concerns for them too. So, you know, I wouldn't, take too seriously either the idea that you know apple is trying to rewrite history i think it's just trying to show a little bit more of the history than we've seen or that you know that they really really had a spectacular time and didn't fight at all because we know that they did fight too 
So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, I really wish that he would put out all 56 reels, <laughs> 56 huh. hours of tape. That's what I want to see. But whatever we get to see, I'll be happy with. And, and uh, you know, if this is the quality that we're going to get, that, that should be great. Yeah. Well, I've always said the more, the more material you, you get, the more that you learn. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember when we did our show on Let It Be, the film, a while back, and it was the first time in a long time that I had watched the film. I was amazed at how I, I didn't find it so depressing. Yeah. And it's just for all these years, you keep hearing about it being, you know, s- such misery, those sessions. And a lot of that uh, you have to blame John for. Because that's how he remembered it and talked about it in interviews. You know, a lot of that comes from he watched the film with Jan Winter. <laughs> and uh, that was like, I think he, he saw it privately with him, mm-hmm. with Yoko. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he wept as he watched it. And those are the memories that he probably has of the Let It Be sessions. Yeah. Um, and so you hear that through the years and you think, oh, these were the most horrible times on earth. And now you're going to get a different view, but I just hope that it's just a, a little bit balanced between the two. Yeah. But we'll see. Darren, what did you think of uh, of this teaser? Oh, it's incredible. The immediately, of course, like everyone else, the things that jumped out at me was, holy smoke, the quality. And mm. boy, they're having a lot of fun. And this seems like they're trying, not the Beatles, but Peter Jackson and company are trying really hard to paint a new picture of the the environment within the band mm. the third thing that struck me was boy george has wild colored clothes <laughs> um, uh, i mean there's a there is a scene there where george i mean i was just, i'm assuming that had a, the outfit had a battery pack in the back uh <laughs> and uh they had some great clothes the beatles i gotta say in those clips but then I, you, you, if you watch it and you pay attention, it seems like the majority of the footage used was taken when they were in the Apple studio. That's right. Mm-hmm. And then you realize, well, you know, supposedly the tensions and uh, took place early on when they were in the Twickenham film studios, that things lightened up a bit when they got to Abbey, when they, I'm sorry, when they got to Apple Studios, when Billy Preston joined them, which was the last, I guess, roughly approximately couple of weeks. And a lot of what we saw in those clips was in the Apple Studios, where maybe the mood had changed and lightened up a bit. That's true. At the same time, like you said, the same thing like you said, Alan, you're together working on a project, whatever it is, for almost exactly one month. There's two of the girlfriends hanging around the first couple of weeks you were forced with having to get out of bed at five in the morning and go to a big studio, something you're not used to stuff's going to happen bad and good, you know? And of course the most talked about scene, George kind of having that little argument with Paul is what everyone talks about over the decades and let it be gets this stigma, Mm -hmm. the movie. You know, of it being them breaking up. Well, there is other stuff. And we know now that, you know, with the White Album, we know that when at least the tape machines were rolling and the mics were on, the Beatles were able to put everything personal and business aside, make music. And that's when, as a group of brothers, that's when they were at their best. That's what you heard with the White Album. You didn't hear the bickering that may have happened two hours earlier. You know, when they were sitting in the control room talking about a business matter. So, but on the surface, the quality and it was long. So, you know, you felt like you got, it wasn't a 30 second trailer or teaser. This was substantial three, four minutes of footage. It was enough to say, all right, I think 2021 is going to be a better year. (laughs) You know, we got this to look forward to and, you know, and, and, and uh, I assume there will be no change in plans with the box set, the audio stuff and yet and still i don't see how the original film is going to fit in all this being reissued but that's part of the plan is it not the the, the original movie re-emerging somehow it is it was anyway yeah i it's wouldn't be surprised be... if that kind of gets brushed under the rug but uh we see we'll see mm. no from what i heard it was going to be released separately on dvd and blu-ray 
on its own, not part of a let it be package. At least that's that's how I understand it okay. at this moment. But you know what you mentioned, the, the, the argument between Paul and George, I think, over the years has been so overblown. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyone who's been in a band, if you watch that, they'll, they'll think this is nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. it's it's a typical argument, right? And uh, but will this new film even cover when George walks out on the band and quits temporarily? Right. You know, there's that side of it too. So we shall see. And I did love, by the way, in this in this teaser, especially when they're rehearsing two of us, and both John and Paul are singing it at each other, and their their teeth are clenched like they're angry. <laughs> you know, that was really funny to see. <laughs> and uh, Ringo's yeah, uh, all green suit. <laughs> that he yeah, wore. I, like I said, with the clothes, it's like holy yeah. smoke, these guys, are, you know. And it looked like it, it looked it just looked like the way the just the colors. I don't know if it would this would have been the camera crews doing. I mean, the sets in Twickenham and Apple Studios just there was a warmth to the environment. Mm. I don't know if you guys know what I'm getting. You know. You know, there was, a, there was just like a tint of coloring, which was probably, again, camera crew, you know, lighting and whatnot for the films. Uh, that's really cool. It really jumps out at you. Yeah. Oh, you know, it was really cool was that they like in a row, they showed Ringo, then Paul, then John, then George, each at the drums. Right. Yeah. That was, as you know, how often do you see John or George at the drums? <laughs> you know, that was a very clever thing to do in yeah. this uh, in this teaser. But yeah, very enjoyable and uh, certainly whetting our appetite. <laughs> yeah. And let's just hope that COVID doesn't cause any more of a delay in this for being released in theaters. All right. Um, so for all the other Beatle news, I'm going to break it down here by different Beatles. And uh, we shall start with the one that has the least amount of news, <laughs> and that is George. And um, something that we heard about a few weeks ago, in fact, Alan, you alerted me to this, and I'm so glad that you, you and Darren are doing the show because I know how big Dylan fans you are. There was an announcement that there'll be a three-disc box set from Dylan uh, called 1970, which will include outtakes from his albums New Morning and Self-Portrait released that year. So this is actually a 50th anniversary release. Actually, it'll be 51 <laughs> when this comes out. This will have outtakes from a session that Bob had with George Harrison on May the 1st, 1970, where they played nine songs, including covers and Dylan originals. And among the Dylan songs are One Too Many Mornings, Gates of Eden, Mama You've Been On My Mind, also, the Everly Brothers, All I Have to Do is Dream and Call Perkins Matchbox. It's coming out February the 26th. So my question to both of you, if you know the answer to this, back around 10 years ago, part of the bootleg series of Dylan, I think it was volume 10, it might have been, had a few tracks from the May 1st, 1970 sessions. And there were songs like Working on a Guru on there and time passes slowly and george was on those and they're not listed on here well those are from november um 68 ah okay yeah the other thing that you know this this release uh that they announced for february was a little surprising because just a few weeks before that um, Dylan had released another of those 50th anniversary sets, uh, you know, to deal with the European copyright issue. And it came out through one store in England with a very small amount. And, uh, you know, they instantly sold out before anybody even ever heard of it, you know, certainly on this side of the Atlantic. But copies of it naturally got you know around and onto the internet and you could get that entire you can get that entire 3d cd set now if you want um it's out there on various torrent sites um and i i, I guess maybe the uh the fact that it was so sought after immediately may have persuaded them that they should put it out commercially i don't i don't know you know it looks like they just put out the minimum the minimum possible uh you know copies of it uh, a few weeks ago just to settle that copyright thing before the end of two, 
2020. See what I mean? Because, mm. yeah. Okay. So those songs that I just mentioned to you are really from what session? The ones from 1968, the, from November. Yeah, I think that um, he went up to Woodstock and visited with Dylan and the band, and I, I thought they were sort of informal sessions. You know, I, I don't know that he, that it was for an album particularly that Dylan was working on. Okay, I thought um, I remember hearing that it was from New Morning, but mm -hmm. you know, I could be wrong. But I thought you know, well, '68 would be a little early for New Morning. Mm. Yeah, because New and also New Morning, I believe was a reaction to self-portrait that um you know self-portrait was such a lightning rod of an album that you know that it was really the first time that the critics beat dylan over the head <laughs> and i don't know if there was a separate separate sessions but dylan quickly scrambled and put new morning out there i could be wrong but i think new morning was uh, sort of dylan's way to kind of correct what people were angry about with the self-portrait stuff yeah you know but they were released very close to one another and it wouldn't be a surprise if the sessions did in fact overlap somehow mm -hmm. okay all right but uh, we'll look forward to uh that new release coming out february 26th and i'm sure we'll talk about it around that time here on the show quick question do you know if this is coming out as the next volume of the bootleg series i don't know what number they're up to it didn't say that it, it it you know usually they say bootleg series number whatever this just says 1970. okay hmm. all right now we go to the lennon camp a few weeks ago we saw a brand new post on facebook saying an announcement for the new plastic ono band box set will be coming in january and that it will have 159 <laughs> new mixes and wow. this appears on their brand new website plasticonalband.com thanks to kevin martin one of our listeners for alerting us to that so a lot there to uh delve into on this plastic on band box set so i'm reading this as though the announcement is in january that doesn't mean the box sets in january although it might be so it, we just know it will be soon Okay, uh, John's recent compilation, Give Me Some Truth, will have an exclusive vinyl release through Target. And it will be an opaque blue vinyl, and it's due out February the 19th. Thanks to Tom Hunyadi, my co-host on Talk More Talk, for that information. John is also on the front cover of the February 2021 issue of Mojo Magazine, issue 327, with the heading on the title, John Lennon, 1940 to 1980, The Long Goodbye. There was also a wonderful piece done on NHK World Japan TV, an interview with Sean Lennon discussing the new Give Me Some Truth compilation and how important it is to him to keep John's music and his message of peace alive in the world. And from Consequence of Sound, we hear that on January 8th, what would be David Bowie's birthday, to celebrate two unreleased cover versions that Bowie made, one for John Lennon's mother and Bob Dylan's song, Trying to Get to Heaven, will be released as a limited edition, two-song, seven-inch single from Rhino Records. There'll be a total of 8,147 copies uh, made, the first 1,000 of which will be cream-colored. Digital downloads and streams are being promised, and Bowie recorded his version of Mother with Tony Visconti, uh, as the producer uh, for a John Lennon tribute compilation album that never happened. Tony Visconti, known for being a producer for Bowie for a lot of his classic albums, and also, uh, you know, on the Beatles side of things, working with Paul on Band on the Run, and also at one time married to Mary Hopkin. And May Pang. Okay. And May Pang. Very good. News on Ringo, and there's plenty of news on him. He just made available a brand new song about peace, love, and friendship called Here's to the Nights. It's part of a five-song EP called Zoom In, which he recorded in his home studio over the last six months. The EP is officially coming out March 19th next year. The song Here's to the Nights has Paul McCartney helping out with backing vocals, Steve Lukather on guitar, Ben Montench on piano, Bruce Sugar on synth guitar, and on bass, Nathan East. 
Also on the record are Joe Walsh, Cheryl Crow, Chris Stapleton, Lenny Kravitz, Ben Harper, Dave Grohl, Jenny Lewis. Just about everybody in the world seems to be on this new record from Ringo. And it was written by the great Diane Warren, one of the uh, most successful female songwriters of the last few decades. The EP has Ringo collaborating with a variety of songwriters and producers, including Jeff Zobar on the title track to Zoom In, Zoom Out. And that song also features the Doors' Robbie Krieger on guitar. Another song is Teach Me to Tango, written by Sam Hollander, who worked with Ringo on the last album, What's My Name? He's known for having worked with bands like Panic at the Disco and Weezer. Another song is Waiting for the Tide to Turn, co-written by Ringo alongside reggae pioneer Tony Chin and engineer Bruce Sugar. And the last song is called Not Enough Love in the World, written by Steve Lukather with fellow Toto member Joseph Williams. You can now pre-order the EP on most outlets, including Amazon, where it's available on CD, vinyl, and digitally. Ringo also posted a holiday message wishing us a Merry Christmas and a different New Year (laughs) and uh, showed us some of the sessions that took place for Here's to the Nights uh, in a video and then released his own video for the song with all of those musicians involved. So from each of you, I'm sure you heard the song and hopefully saw the video. What were your impressions? Darren, we'll start with you. I like the song a lot. I have heard it a few times. Kind of, I think my reaction to it is similar to how I reacted to Liverpool 8. The song Liverpool 8, liked it a lot. Have no issues with it. It's not like, you know, going to change the world, but it's another solid Ringo song. And um, yeah, I like it. Sounds like I don't like it the way I'm reacting, but I do. I, I do like it. And I'm looking forward to the EP. I wish, I still wish he would have done a full length album. I don't quite get that logic behind they don't buy albums, so why make albums? Here's an EP. Well, just if you added five more songs, the same people that are buying the EP are going to buy the album, aren't they? You would but, think. You know, <laughs> we live in a different world. So <laughs> I guess uh, so. A good song. Good song. Very happy about it. We're very happy to hear it. A couple of FUV people are amongst all of those guests that you didn't mention uh yola vocalist yola and her album was one of wfuv's biggies of 2019 um and also eric burton b-u-r-t-o-n one half of the band black pumas uh is on that uh and black pumas actually uh i think have been nominated for a bunch no i don't think i know have been nominated for a bunch of grammy awards coming up for their debut album which, uh, you know, for those people who were criticizing McCartney for doing all of the colored vinyl and whatnot and ways of selling more copies, Black Pumas put their album out in 2019. And for the one year anniversary, put out a deluxe edition with bonus tracks and vinyl singles and covers. And so, but Eric Burton's one half of that band out of Austin, Texas. And he's another one of the guys, uh, of the many guests on Here Come, uh, Here's to the Nights. So, yeah. Mm. And also, if you if you watch the video, I kind of feel like the backing vocals for Paul were pushed up in the mix. You hear him more in the video than I do on just hearing the audio alone. If you're playing, uh, you know, an MP3 of it or whatever. Yeah. Alan, how about you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel pretty much the same as Darren, um, and and I I agree. You know, it's as if he's putting out one side of an album instead of a whole album. I, I don't understand that either. You know what, Alan? It's becoming the norm today. Not just uh, it's unusual that a veteran artist like Ringo, and also Jefferson Starship, and from what I understand, the Doobie Brothers are doing EPs. Now, Jefferson Starship somehow is continuing without Paul Kantner. They put out an EP this year, their first new music in in a very long time. Mm -hmm. The Doobie Brothers said that they were going to release an EP, and then their 50th anniversary tour got postponed the next year. I assume the EP comes now next year. So it's, I think, unusual for veteran artists to start turning towards Mm -hmm. EPs instead of full-length albums, but it's starting to happen. Yeah. And a lot of the younger contemporary artists 
EPs are commonplace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's true. I guess what yeah. we're so what we're probably seeing is a shift in the way you know artists are are thinking about projects. You know, not in album terms, and and uh, we just need to catch up with it because we're. Uh, at least I am up in the geezer department where we think of an album as an album and that it's, you know, that it's a, a, a full artistic statement on an album with, mm. you know, 10 to 12 to 14 tracks. But I guess it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, mm. Ringo's decided it won't be. So there it is. Yeah. Well, I'm uh, another, guys, another one. I'm sorry. I don't mean to jump in. Remember Semisonic? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Their big hit was closing time, right? Yeah, they 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 put out their first new music in nineteen years this year. It was an EP. <laughs> so, well, I kind of feel like like both of you. Uh, the same fans that would buy an EP from Ringo are the same fans that will buy a full album. I don't really see the difference, but maybe this way, there's less work for them to do. If it's half an album, they could put it out more periodically, so their names are out there. You know, maybe you'll get an EP every year as opposed to one Ringo album every two years. That kind of thing. Uh, we're, starting, we're starting to sound like that Dana Carvey character on Saturday Night Live. When I was young, <laughs> we got three hour long albums and we really? liked it. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these these are definitely uh, change in times. But uh, I'm happy to get anything from Ringo. So the fact that this came out at the end of the year, as well as McCartney 3, cause for celebration in the Michaels household. Um, other Ringo news, Ringo tweeted that his new single was the number one song on iTunes with Wonderful Christmas Time being at number three and the McCartney 3 album at number one on iTunes. This is just iTunes, not Billboard. We'll have to wait for Billboard. Ringo tweeted, wow, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Very clever. Uh, the boys are back on top. Peace and love. Peace and love. <laughs> so at least on iTunes, it's doing really well, as mm -hmm. is the McCartney 3 album. Ringo is interviewed in Rolling Stone by Rob Sheffield. And Ringo talks about not only this new EP, but that he's also putting out two books. One of those books is about his all-star bands called Ringo Rocks, 30 Years of the All-Stars, 1989 to 2019. It's a new retrospective limited edition hardcover book available exclusively online at Julian's Auctions for $39.99, with proceeds going to benefit Ringo's charity, the Lotus Foundation. It's described as a commemorative photo memoir featuring some never-before-seen photos of the All-Star Band's 30 record-setting years in the spotlight and life on the road, compiled by Henry Diltz and Jill Jarrett, as well as exclusive images from many other photographers and members of his touring crew. Along with the photos are Ringo's candid stories, looking back as the leader of one of the longest-running touring bands in the world, and all that goes into managing a band of legends. It also includes a forward from Joe Walsh. And there are sections in the book that covers Ringo's world-renowned exhibition, Ringo, Peace and Love, that was at the Grammy Museum in 2012, and also Ringo's induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2015 is covered here as well. And there's even a chapter on Ringo's love affair with Ludwig Drums. You can also order a copy of this book autographed by Ringo, for which only 500 copies were made. And that will sell for $495. If you'd like to order the regular copy or you want to uh, invest in this rare version of the, of the book that Ringo has signed, go to juliansauctions.com. That's J-U-L-I-E-N-S, not like Julian Lennon, juliansauctions.com. Ringo also has a second book coming out, Painting Is My Other Madness. So this is something, the, the All-Star Band book is, is something I've been wanting for a long time. I wondered why it took so long for Ringo to, to uh, actually decide to do this. So many great All-Stars he's had in all the lineups through the years. It would make a great coffee table book, <laughs> I've thought through all these decades, but I'm glad to see this is being done. Uh, give, give me a minute here. I, uh, you guys talk amongst yourselves. I'm emailing Santa Claus. 
and trying to get uh, something added onto my Christmas list. Uh, <laughs> Ringo rocks, autograph <laughs> version. My wife will pay for shipping. Okay, go ahead. Next. Sorry. Okay. Well, Ringo could be Santa Claus. I know he wants to be Santa Claus. Well, I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Other Ringo news. He was interviewed in the Beverly Hills Courier, a piece called A Rare Conversation. He also appeared on the Today Show on Thursday, December the 17th, talking yes. about, uh, you know, the new album. And that's about it for Ringo News. Did you want to talk about the Today Show interview, Darren? For some reason yeah. that morning, I had, uh, I had NBC on and they were going to have Ringo on. I was like, oh, that's great. I'm going to catch this. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. Nice to see him get some really good exposure. And it was also the timing was a little interesting, too, with McCartney's album coming out. I wonder if any of that ever, if there's anything that, you know, that they take into consideration when things get announced. Timing mm. was kind of interesting to put out the new song a couple of days before McCartney 3 is about to be released. But, but yeah, well, I don't really remember it, though, now, but I did see it. I think they both wanted to make a statement, Paul and Ringo, and put out something right before the end of the year. A year that for most of us has been the most miserable, just to have something, something to celebrate, even though in the case of Ringo, it's just one song. But the announcement about the EP in March, you know, goes along with it. And uh, just to see Ringo so positive and he looks so damn great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you listen to the new song, his singing is really good on it. And in fact, at the very end, he holds this note which kind of reminds me a bit of what was said about with little help from my friends, how they used to encourage him to, you know, to hold that note at the end of the song. But his voice sounds really good on the new song, which, by the way, really has a New Year's Eve kind of feel. Lift the glass up and here's to the nights we won't remember and the friends we, we won't forget. It's a great message right there. Mm. and uh, Very pleasant sounding song. I like it a lot. Okay, uh, and now we finally have Paul. Where Oops. do you even start? <laughs> oh, my. We'll start with the announcement on December 21st that a special offer was made on Amazon that you can order McCartney 3 as a digital download for only three ninety nine. The offer was good for three days. Great price right there. Last show, we learned that in addition to all the various colored vinyl and CD bundles being released, they issued a CD and SHM CD version of McCartney 3 in Japan that has all four bonus tracks that are on the colored CDs. And they are all alternate versions of songs from the album. It's not different songs from the album. What you will have is Women and Wives, a studio outtake, Lavatory Lil, studio outtake the kiss of venus a phone demo and sliden what they call dusseldorf jam it was announced a few weeks ago that there was an exclusive new yellow vinyl version from mccartney 3 now available with 3,000 copies made available worldwide there is a new blue vinyl version of mccartney 3 exclusive to the u.s and canada available through barnes and noble there's also a violet vinyl version of which 3,000 copies were made. And just announced last Thursday, <laughs> if you can keep track of all this, you can get the McCartney 3 album as a deluxe digital album through his website with the same four bonus tracks that I just mentioned that are on the Japanese CD and uh, colored CDs. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> You're all going to be no booklet. No booklet. No booklet comes with it. What's that? But it doesn't come with the booklet or anything like that. No notes. No credits. Um, no, the, the, just the book, a, just the cover with that's a coming you know. In January the, the booklet. Mm -hmm. the booklet's coming in January. <laughs> um, going to re reintroduce uh, Neil Young's Pono or whatever the heck it was called, and uh, it'll be preloaded with McCartney three, and you'll get the booklet. And there'll be colored <laughs> devices also, five of them. Maybe they should make mm. different versions of the booklet. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Paul has continued to put out EPs through Spotify, always on a Friday, with six songs that have a theme to them. 
following his first two, which dealt with home and Christmas. He put out one November 27th with the theme of family. And on December 4th, he put out one with the theme of love. There was an interesting promotion from McCartney 3 in coordination with Amazon Music. It's called the 12 Days of Paul <laughs> campaign. The idea was to pick 12 major cities from around the world, display a mural in each city, which would have the sheet music for a different song from McCartney 3. And they would then encourage musicians who presumably have not heard Paul's new recordings of these songs to cover them on their own and make videos for them. Obviously, as you would expect in this pandemic, I, I highly doubt fans tried to visit the murals. But somehow fans were provided a link to see the sheet music. They could then cover the song and make a video and send it to Paul's website and also on social media using the hashtag of 12 Days of Paul and tagging Paul McCartney. So there were uh, plenty of cover versions that I noticed online of songs from McCartney 3. And uh, coinciding with this campaign, Amazon Music has launched rediscover mccartney a brand new expertly curated career-spanning playlist of mccartney's music available exclusively through amazon music it's an eclectic and essential collection of songs from paul's solo catalog 31 songs in total from the first mccartney album through egypt station so another playlist right there you've got spotify ones and you've got this one now from amazon music Paul is continuing to premiere newly remastered videos of his on YouTube with coming up premiering on November 20th. And a few weeks ago, he premiered the remastered video for Waterfalls, which really makes you wonder if there might be plans in the works for uh, a remastered McCartney Years box set. Now to talk about some of Paul's appearances in interviews that he's done audio and video wise. I think I mentioned on the last show not positive, but there's a new podcast show called Smartless, which is hosted by Jason Bateman. Sean Hayes is in it, along with Will Arnett. It's an Apple podcast. Paul gave an interview to them. He also appeared on the podcast show, The Adam Buxton Show. Also, he was on Howard Stern's show as well. Uh, he appeared last Thursday night on Jimmy Fallon's show, also on Chris Rock's YouTube show, called Released, where he premiered the new video for Find My Way. And along with that new video, there are now uh, what they call lyric videos made for Women and Wives, Lavatory Lil, and When Winter Comes. And there's a brand new video altogether for When Winter Comes, which just premiered a few days ago. And it's really wonderful. It's all animated. Jeff Dunbar worked on that. Same guy that worked on you know, Rupert and the Frog song and McCartney's animated uh, shorts. And um, by the way, I don't know if you noticed this. Did you both see the new video? From yep. Okay. The Jeff, Dunbar, the Jeff Dunbar video? Yeah. At the very end, as they have the yep. credits roll, they have more instrumental music from Paul. And if you look in the credits, it says the three I songs. Have, yeah, I have it written here. They present it as a medley. Right. When Winter Comes, which is how the song appears on the album, and then right. there's Winter Sun, a third right. section. Yeah. So there's something there's on there that's not on the album. When they put out the colored boxes in March. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> there's your bonus track right there. All right. Darren's on to something. Just might happen. You never know. Uh, a few other things. Last Friday, he was on BBC Radio 4 on the Today program. He was on BBC Radio 2, Idris Elba interviewing him. Also CBS This Morning, this past Sunday. And on Apple Music, there was a really great video interview that Zane Lowe did with him. So with all these different interviews, would you, either of you, like to comment on any of them? Did we mention Chris Rock as well? Yes, we did. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to keep track of all you know, I know. so many of them, but yeah. Well, you know, we learned that, um, I don't know if any of you knew this, but he dreamed yesterday. No. <laughs> Who broke that one? <laughs> well, I don't know. I think it was all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
No. Yeah, you know, they, they were generally pretty interesting interviews. I mean, he did a few of the old classic stories like Dreaming Yesterday and... Uh, getting better. You know, getting better. But, you know, I mean, I suppose there there might be a, a person or two on the planet who hasn't heard those yet. Uh, so this is their chance. And, uh, you know, the, the Zane Lowe one, as you said, was really, really pretty good. And, you know, each one has a little bit more detail about recording the new album, which I suppose is the most interesting stuff in these interviews, because his Beatles stories and, you know, wings and uh, in between, he's told those so many times. This is the new material, you know, on, on McCartney 3. And, uh, you know, it, it, it is kind of interesting. I don't know what, you know, they... they have been pitching this as a surprise album, and I suppose it was in the sense that he wasn't scheduled to put out an album in 2020. But, you know, if you were to guess, okay, Paul is stuck at his place in lockdown, or rockdown, as he says, and uh, he happens to have this incredible studio at the mill, um, which is on his property. You know, what would you guess he would do? I mean, we all know that, you know, he's one of the planet's, uh, you know, biggest workaholics, you know, he, he could do nothing if he wanted to, mm. but that never seems to be an option for him. It's, it's like, if there's a chance to make music, he's going to make music. Um, so it seemed pretty much, uh, you know, pretty obvious that he was going to be making an album, whether we would hear it is another thing, right? Because he's always recording demos and, you know, you know, who knows what, but, um, yeah, you know, but it, it's, it, it, it has been interesting hearing him talk about these things. There's another thing that if you read all the interviews, which you sort of have to do if you're in our line, <laughs> he gave an interview to the New York Times magazine. And when asked about Lavatory Lil, he said, well, you know, this was someone I knew and I thought she was okay. And she turned out to be a baddie was the way he put it. Mm -hmm. And he said, I will never reveal who it's about. I think a lot of us have a pretty clear idea who it's probably about. I mean, the lyrics are, you know, kind of make it seem to make it clear. But then subsequently, he began <laughs> saying, it's not about anybody. It's a totally fictional song. It's really not about anybody. Um, so those two things contradict themselves, you know. But I guess we'll get to that when we talk about the album. Yeah. Well, you know, that, that interview from Apple Music, I found to be one of substance really talking about the songwriting process for him and in particular how very often he won't write about a specific person or he'll disguise it and veil it you know he doesn't like doing that he he um he doesn't like to make things so obvious <laughs> but uh it's really fascinating if you watch that interview all the different ways that he goes about writing songs it could start with just hearing a particular chord and that will remind him of something i remember in this this apple music interview he just talked about the chord of c and for some reason it immediately took him back to the song young love from the 50s which was a huge hit for tab hunter and actually paul recorded the song with mary hopkin on uh postcard but Certain certain chords might evoke a certain memory or take you to a certain place, and that'll lead you to writing something about it. And, you know, all the different ways that you can come up with with a song is what he discussed more in detail. And I think he did more of it in this particular interview than I've heard in previous interviews. Also, just talking about Doris Day <laughs> and an interview which he did, which I found to be really nice. You know, there some of these interviews, like the one with Adam Buxton, I thought was pretty good. I made note of the fact that he talked about how this pandemic affected him in the in the sense that he really misses touring, but also how it's affected his crew, which you don't even think about. But um, he did mention that he has spent a fortune in recent years on insurance fees for his crew. So with all that happened this past year, it actually paid off for him. And he talked about streaming services and uh, how artists are not paid that much for streaming. But at the same time, those services are so powerful now, like Spotify. You know, so just different subjects that were approached 
along with the new album. But uh, you do kind of notice that when he does interviews all at once, there will be certain things even beyond the new album that he'll repeat saying. Like, yeah, for some reason, he'll bring up how difficult a childhood John mm-hmm. Lennon had compared to the one that he had. And he'll say this in a few interviews, almost like he's prepped to say that, you know, in several interviews, that there are like bullet points. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I remember just when, um, when Sean Lennon did those interviews at the time of Give Me Some Truth, and uh, he interviewed Paul along with Elton John and Julian. And uh, the big news was that Paul sang a little bit of Just Fun, <laughs> the early Lennon McCartney song in there. He goes on Sirius XM, Alec Baldwin is interviewing him, and he says the same thing. <laughs> he goes into Just Fun. It's like he prepares himself. He knows in the back of his mind he's going to be talking about this. So then he uses it on several interviews. There's a degree to which for Paul an interview is a performance too. Mm-hmm. You know, and so he knows what he wants to say and 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 he says it. I mean, with some interaction from the interviewer who will push him in a different direction if you know, if possible, but uh you know, but he but he knows the things he wants to say and, and he gets them across. It's true. Right. He's he's a very good interviewee. <laughs> Uh, I wasn't too impressed with the Jimmy Fallon interview or the Chris Rock one. Jimmy Fallon is a case where when he first interviewed Paul, I was thrilled because he was holding up different albums of Paul's that he had bought and listened to, holding up Tug of War, doing them chronologically on camera. And I'm saying, hey, this is a fan. This is someone who knows his music. And then he does this interview with Paul. And he's talking about the first McCartney album, and he asked Paul, who did the photo? Hmm. <laughs> I mean, you kind of have to know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think in, in some cases people are hard on interviewers, um, but a lot of the times, especially I would think for a TV interview for a, a very broad popular audience it isn't necessarily just Beatles fans I think they you know sometimes ask questions that they know the answer to but feel that the answer needs to be put out there so he'll ask a question like that that he knows the answer but wants Paul to say on the show you know what it was I, I I'm pretty sure that Maybe I'm just being too generous, <laughs> mm. but I, I think that's probably what's going on in, in cases like that. Well, he could have just said Linda did the photo, right? Yeah, he could have. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I, I mean, it's like, you know, all the people reacting to the I Dreamed Yesterday story saying, no, you're kidding. I mean, mm. they, they have to have heard that story. You know, it's, I, I think now it's, it's um, innate knowledge. Children are born knowing that story. <laughs> you know? Ooh, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. He dreamed up yesterday. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got the story about Hey Jude that I'm going to tell you later privately because I don't want it to spread, <laughs> Darren. <laughs> Jimmy Fallon's a little bit too much of a fanboy for me, not only with the interviews he's done with Paul, but other artists as well. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I just, I didn't see the Jim, I didn't see it when it happened live. I was sick at the time. I knew it was coming up, and when it came time to, you know, put the TV on, I just was not feeling well. I'm like, I don't think Jimmy Fallon's going to make me feel any better, so I'll skip it and watch it in my own time. And mm. I couldn't, I couldn't sit through the whole thing online. I just, you know, I just couldn't. Some of the other interviews, which I'm still in the process of catching up on, seem so much more substantial. And you didn't mention the CBS this morning yet, uh, Sunday morning, not this morning. Uh, That was really nice. Well, you know, you see so many of these interviews where he's talking about the new album and they all become a blur (laughs) sometimes because they're all very similar in that regard. But um, the longer ones tend to be much better because you have a chance to talk about something else. Right. Um, But uh, Chris Rock, you know, it was nice that he premiered the video for Find My Way. The thing that I liked about Chris Rock was that he said, you know, everything that you do is going to come out eventually, (laughs) you know, and uh, I think Paul had said that, you know, he records so much stuff on his phone now to make sure that it's saved. And then he said he has 2000 songs that haven't come out. I'm sure it's an exaggeration. 
did he say that on Chris Rock? I think it was, but he said it in one of the interviews. But um, he did yeah. allude to that in the Sunday morning, CBS Sunday morning, about having uh, the kiss of Venus in his phone. Uh huh. And as it turns out, that's one of the bonus tracks is the phone right. version. Right. Yeah. Hmm. OK, but uh, certainly Paul has been busy promoting this as best as he can with the situation being what it is right now with the pandemic. So uh, we will wait to see how it debuts on the charts. Uh, we'll know in a week from now. OK, um, Rolling Stone magazine has just put out their list of the top 50 albums of 2020 and McCartney three ranks number 40 which I think is not all that bad considering it just came in right under the wire. And they also say that uh, McCartney three is his most adventurous since chaos and creation in the backyard. I don't know if I'd agree with that, but it's an no. interesting uh, quote. I mean, mm -hmm. electric arguments, I think was a, a bit mm -hmm. more adventurous. Also the very big news announcement about Paul, aside from all the McCartney 3 news, is that he and producer Rick Rubin will be joining forces and creating a six-part documentary on the history of Paul's career. A trailer has been released in which Paul and Rick are in a non-disclosed studio location discussing how the bass guitar can control a band while showing vintage uh, footage of the Beatles and McCartney from the uh, archives. It is said to be the first time that the original Beatles masters are being used for something that left Abbey Road. Endeavor Content is the company that will finance this project and handle worldwide sales. Film 45 is producing this, uh, along with Frank Marshall, who just directed the new documentary on the Bee Gees. The trailer for Paul's documentary just says coming soon. So I'm sure you both saw this video. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, it, it, it showed them playing, you know, come together and some other, you know, bits of other uh, Beatles studio tracks. And that obviously is going to whet the appetites of an awful lot of people, uh, certainly me. So, but it, you know, it didn't show you really enough to know what it's going to be, just enough to tantalize you, which I guess is the job of a trailer like that. Mm. Yeah. Darren? You know, I mean, I was very excited by the fact of the, that this is being done and it's going to be coming out six parts. Sounds like it'll be very substantial, uh, unlike a Jimmy Fallon interview. Um <laughs> But it was it was it wasn't enough of a teaser to really, you know, didn't really totally explain what this was all about. Then afterwards, you know, it's a six part thing with Rick Rubin. So uh, and Rick Rubin's pretty incredible producer. So it's an, yet another thing. It seems like 2021 is going to have uh, a million really exciting things for us. And now this documentary. Yeah, I'm excited about the fact that it's Rick Rubin that's working with him. The one thing that I question is that not that long ago, we heard about a documentary in the works that was supposed to cover all of Paul's solo career, and it was supposed to culminate in Paul's appearance at Glastonbury this past year. And obviously that didn't happen, the concert. But what happened to that documentary? And could that be part of this? I don't know. <laughs> so we'll have to wait and see. A few more news items, and then we'll get to our main topic. The long-awaited follow-up to the book, Those Were the Days, The Beatles and Apple, will finally be a reality. The original book from 2002 from Stefan Granados told the definitive story of the Beatles' Apple organization. The new book, Those Were the Days, The Beatles and Apple 2.0, takes you up to date with how Apple has had to adjust to the changing industry. They've had to adapt to function in a digital world continually putting out product and archive releases. They've become a Las Vegas attraction and done more to build on their brand and become a multi-million dollar organization. The author has conducted interviews and key players at Apple over a 25 year period. And the book keeps you up to date on the continuing saga of Apple. It's due out in the UK on February the 26th. And in the U.S., we'll have to wait till May 22nd. Thanks to Tom Brennan for this information. Can you repeat the author's name again? 
It's Stefan Granados, G-R-A-N-A-D-O-S. And one last item here, Beatlenews.com reports that a 180-minute documentary on the life of Neil Innes, covering his full life story from the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, the Ruddles, and his collaborations between the Beatles and Mighty Python, uh, just aired on BBC Radio 4 <laughs> Extra, which is a BBC digital radio station. It was in three one-hour installments. The series was called Neil Innes, Dip My Brain in Joy, and uh, it already aired on BBC Radio 4, but it's still available um, at uh, this link. You can hear all three of these programs. It will only be available for a short time at bbc.co.uk slash programs. That's bbc.co.uk slash programs. And just a few more news items. New cover versions have come out. One of Happy Christmas War is Over. That's from Alanis Morissette. Also, Billie Eilish has a new cover out of the George Harrison Beatle classic, Something. Both those songs are available digitally. And we end on a sad note, and that is of the passing of Chad Stewart, who was one half of the team of Chad and Jeremy, part of the British invasion. They were known for many hits like A Summer Song, uh, Yesterday's Gone, Willow Weep for Me, and also Distant Shores. Both Chad and Jeremy and Peter and Gordon were the two big duos to emerge out of the British invasion. They even appeared on some of the top TV shows of the 60s, like the Dick Van Dyke Show, the Patty Duke Show, and they were even on Batman. And uh, Chad died from pneumonia. I hear that it was not COVID-related, and he was 79. And I had the pleasure of seeing Chad and Jeremy in concert many times, as well as Jeremy with Peter, uh, Peter Asher, uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, so enjoyable to see them in concert. They still sounded so great, harmonizing together. And uh, very sad news. And I also interviewed the two of them together, Chad and Jeremy, and Chad on his own. And uh, if anyone's interested, on my website, on my page called More Interviews, you can listen to the interview I did with Chad by himself, Chad Solo, just talking about the Chad and Jeremy years, all their hits, and uh, Beatles stories in there, too. Okay? All right. Okay. So on we go with our main topic, and that is the release of McCartney 3 on December the 18th. And as we all know, Paul was in lockdown, as we as we talked about, because of the pandemic. And in the course of doing that, he recorded all these songs. Some of them were brand new. Some of them were songs he had to finish. Um, there's even a song in there, When Winter Comes, which goes all the way back to when Paul recorded Calico Skies with George Martin. It's from that same period. So uh, altogether, there are 11 songs on the album. Plus, we have the four bonus tracks with the uh, different versions of the songs that, that I just mentioned. So we're going to talk about this album and, uh, first of all, find out from each of the two of you what you were expecting before this album came out. And did this album meet your expectations? Not talking so much about the quality, but what you were expecting concept-wise out of Paul and what you thought it might sound like. <laughs> Did you think it would be more like the first McCartney album or, or McCartney 2? What exactly? Um, Alan, let's start with you. Um, I guess to the degree that I had any preconceptions, which, you know, you know that it's hard to do with Paul because he does so many different things. Um, I probably expected it to be more like McCartney 2 because, you know, we, we know that he likes to experiment and that the McCartney solo one-man band concept um, has given him an opportunity to do that more than the band albums or albums with, where he's collaborating with other musicians. And so I probably expected it to be more like that. And, and in that sense, there was a lot less of that than, than I expected. But it also wasn't like McCartney 1, you know, well, just McCartney, because... Mm -hmm. 
if, if nothing else, just the technology, the difference in technology between 1970 and now. I mean, in, with, with McCartney, he had, uh, you know, the, the, the Studer four track mm. and a mic <laughs> yeah. and no mixer and no VU meters. And it really was seat of his pants. I mean, that said, a bunch of that album was actually done in the studio, but he started it at home and decided by the end of December 69 that he he had the start of an album, that it wasn't just a home project, um, and then went into the studio. I think he only did um, one, I think every night was the only thing he did at home after December 69. Um, but I think he ran into frustrations with that setup. And yeah, it's 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 different than the others. I mean, I, I don't think you can really call these a trilogy, which a lot of people are doing, because a trilogy kind of implies an overall, you know, arching sense of structure that unites all three. It, it, I, to me, it also implies the idea, if you say something is a trilogy, what's implied is that it was meant to be a trilogy, which right. this wasn't, you know. But um, Paul, Paul is going along with that. He it's is even, going along with it. It's even on his website um, that way. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. But I, I look at that as just marketing. You know, I don't know. Uh, because, you know, if you look at it, I mean, he does a lot of stuff by himself, too. You know, it has over the years, even a couple of even a few things with the Beatles. He he played everything. Mm. It was just that, you know, he's done a lot of things just by himself over the years as well. And going back to the demo for Come and Get It mm. that he did for Badfinger. You know, he did that in like an hour mm. on his own in Abbey Road Studios. So, you know, uh, and I just think some of the fireman things too. I mean, there's been some question about, you know, well, is, is that a collaboration with youth or is it really just him? I, I kind of think that youth's uh, contributions there were more in co-production and, you know, we also occasionally, occasionally he'll release something, you know, just a, a little thing with, uh, you know, maybe a different version of uh, Band on the Run or something. There's a couple of tracks that he's brought out weird different versions of that he's done by himself. And they quickly disappear. They turn up on a, you know, a radio interview or something or, you know, I uh, can't, can't really remember where some of these are sourced from, but, they, but they, they're out there. Mm. Um, you know, so one he, thing I found interesting when this announcement was made about McCartney 3 is that a lot of people wrote in on Facebook saying that they thought that Chaos and Creation in the Backyard really was McCartney 3 because Paul mm. does play most of the instruments. He does have outside musicians like on Jenny Wren. And there's even one song like Follow Me, which has members of his band on there. But for the most part, you know, it's it's more Paul than anything else. So but it wasn't called McCartney 3. Right. Yeah. Well, so the whole trilogy thing, you know, it's it's you know, take it or leave it. You know, <laughs> I mean, the but, case of chaos creation in the backyard, the role that Nigel Godrich played on that album is so significant hmm. that even if Paul did play every instrument, there was no other outside uh, input from you, other, any other musicians. I don't think you could have called Chaos McCartney three. I mean, because guy M Nigel Godrich is so prominent in that sound of that album. So I, I never thought of it as that. I just thought uh, Chaos parts of uh, Flaming Pie, parts of Driving Rain, you know, are examples of Paul doing the whole thing himself. But there have only really been these three albums that. For all intents and purposes, at least 90, 80 percent, 90 percent was Paul doing everything. Mm -hmm. Thus the, the McCartney names. So. Right. Were you thinking, Darren, this would be more like McCartney one or two? I didn't expect it to be like two simply because of the time it was recorded. in. I think what I was ex I think what I was expecting was something maybe that was a little bit more like one. And this was actually more finished and constructed as an album more so than both one and two. But for the most part, I think it met my expectations because it had elements of one and two in it. For example, it was more finished sounding than one was, and there was more work put into the sound of the songs, which was the case also with two. Yet 
it seemed as though, you know, the organic nature of the instrumentation, three mirrored one, whereas two was old tech, you know, old synths and, and uh, programs and loops and whatnot. So I don't know. It's kind of like a non-answer I gave there. I think there was enough elements of the approach and the song structure that three, I guess, really did really did kind of uh, meet what I expected it to be. It was a little more finished than I thought it was going to be, though. You mm-hmm. know, it bookends the album with Long-Tailed Winter Bird, you know, whereas McCartney 2 wasn't like that. Maybe, you know, McCartney 1 had more ad-libbed moments and made-up-on-the-spot moments. That's not the case with 3. I thought there would be more of those sort of fragments. Even McCartney 2 had you know, instrumentals that seemed fully fleshed out, but maybe would have been songs that had lyrics if they were meant to be on Tug of War or something. This album has finished songs with lyrics in there and uh, on everything, um, almost everything, just about everything. So there was little elements of both of them. I think that the, 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 the thread is simple. It's Paul doing, for the most part, the entire album, everything on his own at home. He didn't have any help on McCartney 2, right? There was absolutely no one else on McCartney 2. Right. But he did have Linda on 1. He, as, 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 as uh, Alan pointed out, 1 was recorded at home. Wait a minute. No, a good chunk of it was done at Abbey Road. So, and 3 has the help of outside engineers. And mm-hmm. I have not really been able to get a my hand on a physical copy yet thank you to the postal service but from what i was reading if this is correct as i turn pages here a couple of members of his band appear on one of the songs yeah sliding right so you know he does have a little bit of outside help like linda contributing to the first mccartney i'm rambling now i'm going in circles here but uh, I think there was enough of a thread to connect the three albums and McCartney three did and yet didn't at the same time sound like I thought it was going to sound. Yeah. It was more, I think ultimately more finished, more polished than I It expected. does. It does say in the booklet that track seven, which is sliding, he gives credit to Greg Kirsten, Alex Pasco, Rusty Anderson, Abe Laboreal Jr. And track 11 also with George Martin and Bob Crashauer. And so in the case of Sliden, you have to figure Rusty Anderson and Abe Laboreal Jr. are on there. With Greg Kirsten's name on there, you have to question, could this be something that might have been left over from Egypt Station? Mm-hmm. So, and yeah. It does say that there are some of part, of, part of McCartney 3 are, are tunes that, or fragments of tunes that have, had existed already. So that, mm-hmm. would kind of, right. that would kind of fit in there. McCartney had right. a similar me was that while Paul intention you know intentionally was recording McCartney to be an album his first McCartney 2 wasn't intended to be an album and he said he yeah. said the same things about the first album that he he wasn't sure whether it was going to be an album or not it, it uh, probably wasn't until the end of December or the beginning of January 70 that he decided he definitely wanted to go ahead and finish it as an album. I was going to ask if you all kind of felt like Paul really knew all along that it would come out because, you know, how do you record an album like in 1979 when he recorded McCartney too, he spent a couple of months on it and then not know what you're going to do with it. Are you really just going to sit on all this music you know, I, I just I have a difficulty accepting the fact that he didn't know he was going to release it, you know, and here he well, is. But it, yeah. In both cases, they could have been demo. He could have looked at them at the start of the project as demos. We had this Possibly. discussion, I think, about if Paul didn't get arrested in Japan in January 80 and Wings tours Japan and they tour North America later in the year, was it possible that McCartney, too, was it, would it have been possible that McCartney too never saw the light of day? That's a good because point. Was, once good... he was, once Paul was kind of recovering from being in jail in Japan, and everything that was on the calendar got canceled for 1980, 
And then a realization, I've got all this music that I made last summer, and McCartney 2 was born. Mm. And in a way, if that is the case, then there's, there is a, that's a big similarity to McCartney 3, that maybe Paul was playing around with stuff in the studio and suddenly found that he had been given months of idle time that he didn't plan on, and McCartney 3 is born. And somebody points out to him, hey, you know, Paul, 70, 80, 20, Huh. Okay. There you go. New album. Yeah. Obviously, he didn't plan to do McCartney three. It's only because of the pandemic that it happened. But I have heard that he did want to have it out by the end of the year because of the year ending in twenty. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think he wants to admit that publicly, but it's it's nice to be able to say that in a conversation. It's a good talking point. I kind of expected this album to be closer to the first McCartney album. I don't know why it was a gut feeling with me. I kind of felt like he, he was more in an acoustic guitar mode. And certainly starting off the album with an acoustic guitar instrumental right in your face, like a uh, long-tailed winter bird, I was kind of expecting it to be, you know, an album of every night's and uh, a man who was lonely's and, you know, quite different from that altogether. And I I do like what you said, Darren, about this being like a more complete album, Uh, whereas like the first McCartney album, a lot of people point to songs as being fragments and not really fully realized or finished, although that's part of the charm of the first McCartney album. But I do think that this this album, McCartney 3, has elements of both the more experimental stuff, you know, like um, Deep Deep Feeling, I would say is closer to. A McCartney two, right type song. I think that's um, what I was trying now. Before I don't know if I did, but yeah. it was executed in a way that was musically similar to the first McCartney album. If there was, you know, if you could imagine the non-album track, why am I forgetting the name of the ten minute? Something like, uh, well, um, help me here. The non-album track what, like, on McCartney two. Yeah, uh, Secret uh, Friend. Thank you. I'm thinking okay. Secret Machine. I'm getting mixed up with Check My Machine. Check My Machine. Um, yeah. uh, so if you took Secret Friend and could somehow turn it into a McCartney track from 1970, long, sort of meandering, but give it more, uh, you know, less synthesized instrumentation, it could be deep, deep feeling, long, a little more organic. Uh, you know, no studio trickery or gadgets or computers or samples, programming and whatnot, you know. So you have a little of both of the albums kind of combined. And I guess, man, maybe, you, had, you know, you had enough time that, you know, let's kind of bookend this album with, you know, and make it, uh, you know, with Long Tail Winter Bird and then uh, that, that theme coming back at the end. And you end up with something that's a little bit more formal uh, mm. in, its, in its presentation. It's kind of interesting to close the album with When Winter Comes, because it takes you back to the acoustic McCartney of the first McCartney album, or even, you know, Ram, Wildlife, even the White Album, makes you think about that particular era. So it's almost like, you know, the perfect coda to this album, rounding out right. the three albums in a way. Hmm. You know, I have, I have a note that I made for myself here on each individual track. And in a way, Long-Tailed Winter Bird, the opening tune sort of, and I don't know if I just said this before, Long-Tailed Winter Bird sort of sounded like it could be a McCartney 2 song, executed like it were something that would have been on McCartney. You know, Long-Tailed Winter Bird, largely instrumental, not entirely, uh, sort of a jam, you know, you know, a frozen Jap in front parlor, huh. instrumental that was sort of jams but were played on synthesizers and keyboards primarily. Uh, that's what Long Tail Winter Bird reminded me of, except it's guitar and drum based and has that element of being kind of like a made in the studio jam. And Paul just put, put some lyrics in there to, you know. Yeah. Interesting that you point that out, because uh, I really love Paul's drumming throughout this album. Yeah. And sometimes I can't tell if they're real drums or electronic drums, but the drumming on long-tailed winter bird is more in line with what's on McCartney too, <laughs> you know, the kind of drumming he did there. So uh, yeah, rhythm- like on frozen Jap, yeah. for example, you know, 
Yeah, rhythmic kind of thing that goes on for a little bit. Doesn't go yeah. anywhere, but it's very ultimately very pleasant and enjoyable. And, uh, you know, just again, the difference being Long Tail Winterbird sounds, if you could stick it on McCartney, like it would fit better because it's drums and guitar and bass and front parlor and frozen Jap are synths and computers and programs and that's it. Yeah. I want to bring up a, a topic here that um, I had mentioned on my other podcast of Talk More Talk. It actually is a show to itself, this particular topic. But, um, you know, in, in recent years, we've come to appreciate the Beatles solo work when they're producing themselves. And I've noticed that, um, you know, a lot of fans are saying more and more uh, in recent years how they'd like to hear the more pure, authentic sounds of each of the four of them when they are their own producers. And every time that I hear someone talk about All Things Must Pass and they'd like to hear it without Phil Spector's production or they'd like to hear Press to Play without Hugh Padgham's production or any of the, the hot producers of the time that Paul tends to work with, Greg Kirsten, you know, uh, Mark Ronson, you know, all the different ones that he's worked with, Ryan Tedder, you know, they'd rather hear the more organic, pure sounds of McCartney. And for that reason, I believe uh, the DIY albums of Paul have really grown in stature through the years, McCartney and McCartney too. And I think noticing some of the comments online from people who love McCartney 3, that's part of the reason why. There was even an article that I had read, a review on McCartney 3, where the writer had said that Paul has discovered that the best producer for him is Paul McCartney. So I'm wondering, with all that Paul has released throughout his post-Beatles career, do you kind of feel like you prefer to hear Paul when another producer is not putting his stamp or his influence on his music? Is he better when he's by himself as a producer? How do you feel about that? You know, uh, hmm. uh, Darren, why don't we start with you? I, 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 you know, it's a great point, and I tend to... Uh lean towards wanting to hear Paul do it his own on his own way. Because I find that looking back in his back catalog, I have not been shy about saying that I'm not nuts for the tug of war album. Because for me, while it was a very well written, very well produced, very shiny and well put together album, the songs tended to be on the soft side for Paul. That was my main complaint about the first half of the eighties of McCartney's music, that kind of like 80s poppy thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was more of a fan of what Wings did. It was a little more rock based from the 70s. Anyway, that aside, I have found that while I loved the production, George Martin's production of Tug of War at the time, and to a little bit of a lesser extent, Pipes of Peace and Broad Street, I find that today the production is a little over the top. On, especially on Tug of War, like, for example, on the song on Take It Away, the horns are so uh, shrill to me. They weren't in 82 when I heard the album for the first time. Today, I would much prefer to hear Take It Away in more of a McCartney 3 approach. Uh, I love, you and I can both love Press to Play. Mm-hmm. And I thought Press to Play was an outstanding album because it was an unorthodox experimental album for Paul coming at a time when he could have used, you know, a big hit album. He went out and did this obscure kind of the production from that album, though, which I loved at the time, makes the album not hold up for me as much today. Even Flowers in the Dirt, I find some of the studio polish on that album it gets in the way. I'm much, and, and maybe that's why I'm one of the only people that really loves Driving Rain. So many people don't like Driving Rain. I think it's because, yeah, maybe it's not the strongest collection of songs he's written, but it's that more of that in studio guitar, bass, drums, less worrying about, less less concerned about production that has that I've grown to uh, become fond of, and mm -hmm. why I like McCartney too much more than new and i think much more than egypt station you know i know what he was trying to do with new and egypt station but i don't think i ultimately like that 
that modern day 21st century Greg Kirsten sound, you know, which I kind of refer to it as, Mm -hmm. you know, that produced for the ears of an Adele fan as opposed to Paul being Paul. Well, that's why I bring this up, because I've noticed so many fans write about this online. I pay a lot of attention to the comments online and I'm amazed. I shouldn't be amazed. (laughs) how much production seems to matter to Beatles fans. You know, people who want to hear Cloud Nine now without the Jeff Lynne production, for example. You know, I, I, at the same time, I also feel that a good part of the success that these albums had initially is because of the production. You know, I don't think Cloud Nine would have been as successful if it sounded closer in style to Gontrapo or somewhere in England. You're right. You know, no, same thing with with all things must pass. I say that, but you know, for the a lot of the fans that didn't care for '80s production and the heavy drum sounds and the synthesizers, the ones that don't like press to play, or when it comes to press to play, they'd rather hear the more conventional production. You know, something more like, I don't know, move over Bosker or, or uh, something simpler, tough on a tightrope or only love remains that kind of stuff, and not hear the production of a of a pretty little head or talk more talk you know would prefer what eric stewart wanted <laughs> with uh press to play and it's the same thing with a lot of mccartney's albums and in the 70s paul had so much success as a producer by himself without relying on the top producers of the time so you got used to that sound of paul as he as he produced himself in that decade and then after that it seemed to be after the George Martin years there, the trilogy, that was a trilogy, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that he went with whoever who was the hot producer whose work he happened to admire. It wasn't just the fact that he was hot, but, um, you know, a lot of people now look back at that and say, instead of trying to sound trendy or trying to sound contemporary, go back to your original mm-hmm. sound, your roots, what you really sound like. And I do believe that is part of the reason why these the, the McCartney and McCartney two album has gone up, and and uh, the impressions that people have of it now. How do you feel about this, Alan? I kind of agree. I I, I prefer the albums that Paul has produced himself. Um, I I actually hadn't thought that much about it till you raised the question, but a lot of the things you know, press to play and. Uh, and and beyond that, um, where he really began casting about for different producers and hot new producers and all of that, I I think that um, it could very well be that the things that I don't like about those albums have more to do with the production than uh, than other things. Uh, you know, in some cases there you know there were there were better songs and worse songs, but. But yeah, like well, through the seventies, you know, he was his producer. Um, I like the, you know, the the ones that were produced by George Martin. I think that, um, you know, they had they had a kind of a a working relationship, and they knew each other so well. I, I think those things work in the same way as I think um, Cloud Nine works in with the Jeff Lynne production. I mean. I think they, I think they were sympathetic together. I, I wouldn't mind hearing it without, you know, if so if, if Danny were to remix it, um, you know, on his own and, it, you know, do it as, uh, but even that wouldn't be really a George, George Harrison self-production. It would be after the fact. Right. But, you know, I mean, look at Ram, you know, if he, a lot of people now think of Ram as, as Paul's best, post Beatles album. That was him. They tried at the very end to bring in Jim Guercio to produce it because the the sessions were going on and on and he'd recorded so many songs and he just wasn't getting finished. Mm. Um, And so they hired Jim Guercio, who was a client of um, Mm. John Eastman. um, And Paul agreed to it. And Guercio came to New York, listened to all the stuff, loved it, bowed out of his own honeymoon to work with Paul on the rest of the album. And, uh, you know, after a, a couple of weeks, basically they parted ways because um, it, it was really disputes over working methods more than anything else. And this, but Ram, this, this mm-hmm. is Chicago's producer? 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I, you know, I didn't. Re- I never. I never knew that they they brought him in. Well, soon you'll be able to read all about it in McCartney Legacy Volume One. <laughs> Log, <laughs> After the log, Beatles, nineteen sixty nine to seventy three. <laughs> out soon. Log, log. <laughs> yeah. yeah, not out soon enough. That but. was all set up, folks. That uh, Alan mm. told us beforehand yeah. that he was going to bring in <laughs> James Jim, James William Gorcio in the conversation. And so. well, no, I'm just kidding. Well, I, I didn't bring up the topic. Oh, uh, <laughs> but but yeah, you know his own productions. I I I think that you know he knows what he wants. And producers may have different ideas about what he wants. And I think Paul is interested in those ideas. I think he's interested in how someone else who is an experienced producer or a hit producer, whatever, what they make of his songs and, you know, he goes with it. But I think in the end, his, his own productions are generally better than, than when he's brought someone in. So I, I agree there. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so let's get to the songs on the album and talk about which ones really stand out for each of you. And um, do you find this this album to be satisfying throughout, or are there some weak moments too? But let's talk about your favorites first. Let's start with Darren. Find My Way is a great song and a hit, possibly, if it had come out 40 years ago or 30 years ago. Uh, I really, really like Find My Way. In fact, long ta- uh, and Long-Tailed Winter Bird, which I liked when I first heard it, it has grown on me so much that, uh, you know, that's the best one-two punch to open an album up from Paul for me personally in a long time. Hmm. Um, I think there were moments on the album where it lags a little bit, but it never gets terrible. It never gets irritating or disinteresting. Some of the tracks that I thought lagged have grown on me, but if I had to pick out my favorites, I'd say Find My Way. I'd say Long-Tailed Winter Bird. He said turning the page. Um, <laughs> winter Bird, When Winter Comes at the end of the album is another highlight for me. The Kiss of Venus is growing on me. I initially didn't like uh, the falsetto vocal. The only tra- Seize the Day is solid. In fact, Seize the Day's message is so much better than Come On People or some of the other, you know, uh, kind of like uh, rallying uh, cry type songs. Um, that, it's another thing I didn't mention yet about McCartney 3 I like. I think lyrically it's, it's so much better than Egypt Station and new. And it's almost like I don't know if Paul actually... I would be interested how he how he approached the lyrics the lyrics on this album because they're so much stronger than what he's done in recent years. But uh, yeah, my key tracks are "I'll Find My Way," "Long Tailed Winter Bird," "Lavatory Lil" is strong. A lot of the tunes are still in the process of growing on me. I like "Sliding." I think the only tune on the album I think is a dud is "Deep Down," and <laughs> uh, maybe. Deep, deep feeling could have used a bit of editing that might have made the song work a little bit better. But even though it meanders at eight and a half minutes long, musically, it's interesting. Um, right. But it, it is ultimately at eight and a half minutes long, one of the uh, weaker moments, I think, on the album. And I think Deep Down is the album's uh, weakest link. Uh, Women and Wives, I didn't like initially. It's growing on me now. I don't think I liked Paul's vocal on it, but the last time I listened to the entire album, which was uh, earlier today, the day we record the show, I thought, you know what? His vocals are, are great throughout this album, really. He's doing what I wanted him to do. Yeah, he can't sing like he did when he was young, but he's figured out how to use the studio and use his voice at 78 years of age, where this is what I would prefer than hearing him attempt to sing maybe I'm amazed live. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm reminded of how when Egypt Station came out and Alan was pointing out that he's writing now songs that suit his voice and he knows what his limitations are and he's writing to that. So, uh, yeah. What song specifically, Darren, did you, were you impressed with lyrically since you, since you said you liked his lyrics here? 
Um, so I'm trying to say here, I say that because I think more so that I really didn't like a lot of the lyrics on Egypt Station. Uh, they were too simple. The sentiments, I don't have the song lists in front of me, but there were too many of songs like, I don't know, okay, hold on, you know, those type titles, that type concept, and that's not here on McCartney 2. The songs just seem a little bit, have a little more beef to them. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't really single out any, because I wasn't reading lyrics at any point. Most of my notes that I made for each individual song pointing out the musicality of the song and less so i don't think i singled out any particular song i thought winter bird well actually no i did the last song winter bird when winter comes mm -hmm. uh sounds like it's lifted right off the b side of a wing single from the 70s mm -hmm. uh, uh I, that may be one of the lyrical highlights on the album when winter comes and again seize the day nice sentiment that he's often gone to but I think in this case, he got it right instead of kind of like half-baked things like come on people and peace in the neighborhood. Uh, oh, I love peace in the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, I don't dislike it. It's yeah, just okay. the, 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 I don't know. It just could have been a little more substantial. The kiss of Venus is very good lyrically. I think, you know, the concept of, of uh, so kind of like a celestial theme is a nice change of pace for Paul coming off an album where there was a song called i don't know one of my favorite songs on egypt station but i could write a song called i don't know you know what i mean so uh, again uh strong ones find my way long tail winter bird i think the weakest track on the album is deep down uh and uh deep deep feeling could have used some editing i think or should have been an instrumental mm. all right Alan, your thoughts, your favorites first. Yeah, um, hmm. you know, that's hard actually, because, uh, well, my first listen to the album, it just sort of washed over me and I didn't, it didn't make a very strong impression. And in a way I was a little disappointed because I had, mm -hmm. you know, was hoping that this would be more immediately interesting. But then, you know, starting from the second play and, going further i mean it, it all began to grow on me and at this point i don't know if i have any favorites or non-favorites i mean i guess non-favorites would be the two darren mentioned deep deep feeling and deep down but even within that i mean there's a lot in those tracks i really like uh mm -hmm. in deep deep feeling you know i like i like the amount of change that that song goes through in eight minutes and 25 seconds right uh, it, it, you know it doesn't just go on the same for for 825 it, it it evolves nicely seize the day has emerged as a favorite in the last uh couple of weeks I say a couple of weeks because it came out less than a week ago but um i reviewed it for the wall street journal so i had a copy and you know played it an awful lot because you know you want to get you want to get past the feeling of um okay i don't know what to make of this it's it's not making a strong impression you want to start listening closely and 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 find stuff that, to say you know um right. i liked long-tailed winter bird from the start and that because you know a bit of that was in the very first uh trailer for the album so you got to hear that opening riff um and i like that it's a very simple opening riff it's a kind of opening riff that basically everybody who owns a guitar has done mm. you know but uh i think he makes it into something and it's it's a very grabbing opener i think uh the the vocal in it you know which you, you almost don't hear as a vocal because it's so processed and distorted. It's it's and it's it's meant to be. Uh, uh, you know, it took away, until I actually got the lyrics. I, I didn't really think of it as I thought. You know, it sounds a little bit like there were words there, but it's uh, so electronic sounding. It's hard to tell. And then I got the lyrics, and um, yeah, there it is. That was a vocal. So. Still, I, I think of it more as an instrumental. Uh, find my way, very catchy. They have pretty boys. I don't know. Uh, I, I see what he's getting at. It's a, a nice little observational song about the world of you know photography and male models and 
and uh, and that I, I like Laboratory Lil a lot, just because I tend to be a fan of the old put down song, you know, from Positively Fourth Street to How Do You Sleep mm. to Too Many People, <laughs> you know. I, I, it's and it's very unusual for Paul. I mean, when he did Too Many People. I think initially it was really only John who noticed that it was aimed at him. You know, you, you go back and you read the early reviews before John began talking about it. And that is not something that people picked up on. In fact, one review thought it was about overpopulation. <laughs> 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 um, so, uh, you know, this Laboratory Lil, I mean, we, we talked about his two ways of describing it um, as being a totally fictional person and being about an actual person who he will never identify. To me, it's kind of hard not to hear it as being about Heather, you know? Mm. You know, uh, there, there are so many things like, you know, you think she's being friendly, but she's looking for a Bentley. Uh, she's acting like a starlet, but looking like a harlot as she's slowly going over the hill. Mm -hmm. um, there are quite a few references there that, you know, seem to fit. But of course, it could be someone else totally. It could be someone we don't know that he spent time with between Heather and Nancy, you know, we're, we're, we're not up on absolutely every moment of his life. Right. Um, and in the interview where he says it was about something that uh, he kind of gives the impression that it's like someone who worked for him, but the lyrics make it clear that it's more than working for him, you know? Well, like, like we were talking about before in that interview, Paul said that he likes to disguise who the song yeah. is about. And in a way, that could be a good thing, but at the same time, there's so many Beatle fans out there that read into his lyrics and think that certain songs have to be about John or the other Beatles when Paul doesn't confirm it, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, like Three Legs. <laughs> a lot of people think yeah. that's, that's directed at the other Beatles, and Paul has never said it was. So how can you say that right. without, without the author of the song admitting it, you know? Although Paul, well, Paul has admitted when it's about John, like with Too Many People or Dear Friend. Yeah, but, um, you know, a lot of the time it makes sense not to admit it, um, you know, and in the case of Laboratory Lil, if it is about Heather, you know, um, he has a daughter with Heather. He doesn't necessarily want to be on record saying, yeah, this is about your mom, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, not to mention any, you know, uh, desire he might have to, you know, keep the peace with Heather, but, but nevertheless, it, it is kind of interesting that he did it, uh, no matter who it's about, because the put down song is not a Paul standard move, right. you know, but seize the day I was, was going to say before, uh, about, you know, how it was emerging as a favorite. What I really like about that song is the descending chord mm -hmm. progression in the bridge, mm -hmm. um, with the somewhat simpler melody over it. That to me is just very, very catchy. That's uh, I can't get that out of my head. Kiss of Venus. You've got the harpsichord in there. I really like that. So yeah, I like, I really like the whole album and, um, it's been a while since I could say that about one of his releases. I, I, I liked Egypt Station. I didn't like everything on Egypt Station. Uh, I like this a lot more than I liked Egypt Station as an album. Um, so yeah. Uh, oh, and Winter Bird, When Winter Comes. I mean, that is just beautiful. And it's recorded in 1992. His voice was still in really good shape. Mm. Um, I find on this album, I, I, I reviewed this for the journal and mentioned it in there too, that apart from writing to what his voice can do now, just listening to the album analytically, you know, and, and to the production, he uses an awful lot of different, a great many, I should say, different techniques to, I don't, I don't know if I should say disguise the fact that his voice is a bit frayed, but, but in essence, that's what it is. You know, he'll sing in falsetto, he'll sing, um, with, you know, with harmonies that also help sort of mitigate anything about how his voice sounds. And, and he does it straight, a couple of, you know, women and wives and find my way, you know, that's, you, you hear a bit of the, um, well, 
I guess the frayed aspect or, you know, there's a little bit of pitchiness there. And, uh, you know, it doesn't really bother me at this point. You know, the, I, I ended my journal review by talking about uh, how his voice and the state of it is a big topic among among his fans these days. But you, you know, have to ultimately come to terms with the fact that a 78-year-old man is not going to sound the way he did at 25 or even 50, you know. He goes out and gives these three-hour shows, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that voice gets a lot of wear and tear. Interestingly, on the, you know, another podcast, The Beatles Naked, that I appeared on recently with Richard Buskin and Eric Taros, uh, it's their podcast, and we talked about the voice, and Richard had interviewed a vocal coach who works with everyone from opera singers to pop singers. And, and basically what this coach said was that, you know, he could, if, if Paul came to him or someone like him, um, he could restore Paul's voice to something closer to what it used to be. But it would require, you know, no drinking, no smoking, you know, uh, exercises, everyday mm -hmm. vocal exercises. And it, it's hard to sort of see Paul doing that. But I'm sure someone must have brought to his attention that this would be possible if he were to, to put in that kind of time doing it. And, uh, you know, he, he's obviously comfortable with the way it is now. And he's done what he can in terms of production and different ways of singing uh, to, to try and disguise that a bit. And I think it works on this album. You know, I mean, I, I don't listen to it and even even find my way in Women and Wives. Uh, I don't listen to it and say, oh, my God, I can't bear this. You know, it's OK. It's it's Paul McCartney in his older voice. There it is. Well, you know, if, if you follow his albums chronologically and you know that in recent years you can hear the difference in his voice, it's a gradual thing. You're accepting it. If you're someone right. who's not really paying attention to what he's done in, in the last several years and you're so used to the Paul of the Beatle days and the 70s and even the 80s and now you hear this and it's like, oh, my God, what a difference, then it's a shock. But you know, Until you get to when winter comes and then it's back to the old Paul. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, on the subject of his voice, it's interesting. I brought this up on the Talk More Talk podcast because my wife knows a lot about singing and and vocal range and everything. And what she said to me, what she noticed was that Paul's mid range is really what's suffering right now. That's what he's struggling with is his mid range. So what you're going to hear on this album is mainly his lower range and his falsetto with a little bit of the mid range in there. So when he's doing harmonies, it sounds very different. It doesn't have mm -hmm. that really full sound, that lush sound that you're so used to with someone like Linda there or Denny Lane or anyone else that's harmonized with him. It doesn't have, even when Paul does all the harmonies himself, you know, in the past, he did tremendous harmony work. Mm -hmm. And now you're, you're hearing a thinner voice and you're not hearing all the different notes that you would hear in, in the harmonies. And it's, 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 it's a big change from what you're used to hearing. Right. Right. But deep, deep feeling has some nice harmonies in it. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there, mm -hmm. there are some through here that uh, are satisfying. I guess that's the, the bottom line word here. There's a, there's a, a lot of, the material on this album and the performances are satisfying. I like them. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to listen to them. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a, I think a good thing, you know, to have a whole album where you don't want to skip any tracks. You know, hmm. he should, he should, he should show Ringo how to do this because <laughs> he wouldn't have to do EPs. See? <laughs> <laughs> I think that, uh, brought out some interesting points, Alan, uh, when you were talking about, you know, the substance of the subject matter in Lavatory Lil. And even though Pretty Boys isn't one of your favorite tracks on there, but there was a top, you know, he was writing about something which to me is unusual for him. And that's kind of like mm -hmm. backed up my my feeling that McCartney 3 is lyrically a stronger album than he's done in some time. And I think he spent time with a couple of engineers working on making his 78-year-old vocals sound as best as they can and like i said before 
I think he sounds better than he did on Egypt Station and Parts of New. And it just reiterates that he, you can work with this, you know, vintage cars can still run and look fantastic, even though they're not the same as they were in their in their day. And a lot of the a lot of the shows on McCartney three What also helped for me the last couple of listenings headphones. You know, mm-hmm. it's uh, you really pick up on all this neat instrumentation. Uh, some of it pretty complex from time to time. Some basic but very clever guitar playing that we don't, we rarely have heard from Paul. And that's where the vocals really started to sound really good with headphones when you're in the studio almost with him. Mm-hmm. Most of my listens have been in the car. Everywhere I go, I've been listening to McCartney 3. Sounds good in the car for me, but I should listen more with the headphones, too. Yeah, I've gotten lazy as I've gotten older. You know, instead of, like, turning up the big stereo to 11, as like I might have when I, you know, a little younger, it's just a lot easier. Just grab the phone and listen to, uh, listen through the speaker on the phone or the iPad, uh, which is sometimes how I listen to things. It's quick. It's easy. Move on. Next. You know, but I grabbed some headphones the last couple of times I listened and it opened up some some doors for me uh, that I didn't have that weren't opened on the initial listens, mm. which were through, you know, audio files on a computer. OK, well, for me, this has been a, an almost thoroughly satisfying album. I mean, I, I really do like all the songs on here. But Deep Deep Feeling, which was a tough listen at first because it went on for over eight minutes, I've grown to like because of all the work that Paul put into the composition. And as a fan of counter melody, he's got several of them going on at the same time here, which takes you back to something like like silly love songs in a way, only in that regard, or like, uh, you know, Wanderlust. I'm a really big fan of when when someone can work in different melodies going on at the same time. And so for me, there's a lot to chew on with Deep Deep Feeling. The thing is that when I'm listening to this album from start to finish, I'm not always in the mood to hear a song that's eight minutes long. But when I am in the mood for it, it's really good. (laughs) Slide In is a song that I love a lot because of the edginess of it. But I do have a problem with the fact that Paul's vocals are pushed all the way back. And I would much rather hear Paul up front, even with a strained vocal, than hear it sound like he's all the way in the back of the room while this was recording. So um, those are my feelings about that particular song. But everything else about it, I, I love. I love the edginess of that song. You always need to have a really good rocker. And I don't think Paul does enough rockers, but uh, this one fits the bill. Just that as someone who treasures Paul's voice, even an aging voice, I'm still more a fan of it being as hot up in the mix as possible. And um, the only other disappointment for me, and it's not necessarily a disappointment, is deep down. Because the, the hook of the song is always in my head. So I can't say that I dislike it, because if it's always in your head, there must be something to it that you really like. But um, it's really what you build around the song in this particular case that makes it work somewhat. But it's still just a chorus that's repeated over and over again. And compositionally, you know, and I apologize if people who listen to Talk More Talk are hearing me say the same thing. There are certain songs that Paul's done in his solo career, like Cosmically Conscious or even Check My Machine, you know, where it's basically the same chorus over and over again and nothing else compositionally to go into it. It's all the instrumentation and everything that you arrange around it that make it an interesting track. But as a composition, you wish there was more work put behind it. So, um, you know, the highlights for me are really, you know, certainly the first five songs in a row. And when I'm in the mood to hear a deep, deep feeling, it's, it's, it's very gratifying. But I do love... Um, you know, long-tailed Winterberg, just to kick in the the album with something like that, which he normally doesn't do, an instrumental to lead off an album, an up-tempo one, and produce so well with an acoustic guitar right in your face. And I, I do love the instrumentation throughout this entire album. I love Find My Way a lot. I loved it on first listen. It reminded me a bit of Ever-Present Past. 
Um, I especially love the the lyrics, and it certainly does make you think about being in the pandemic. You never used to be afraid of days like these, but now you're overwhelmed by your anxieties. Let me help mm-hmm. you out. Let me be your guide. I can help you reach the love you feel inside. Really strong lyrics like there. And uh, that's the kind of song that if it was played on Top 40 Radio, when that format played, Paul, in the 70s and 80s, would be a hit back then. He's never lost his gift for writing catchy songs and great hooks. I especially love Women and Wives. That's one that was like a sleeper. And once it hits you, it's like, I can't get the song out of my head. It reminds me a bit of At the Mercy from Chaos and Creation. Very simple piano, very dark sounding. And I like the message in the song as well. Pretty Boys I like a lot. And he got that whole idea because he read the story of... um, a photographer that was taking advantage of a male model. There was a news story about that. So he built the song around that. Laverty Lil is a fun track. And yeah, the lyrics are a lot of fun, (laughs) Uh, verse by verse. And um, I would much, much more appreciate that song if it had a full band to back it up. It sounds more, you know, uh, tepid or laid back the way that it's done here on the album and um yeah i like uh, the kiss of venus a lot despite the fact that it's all done in falsetto and with some strain on the falsetto it's just a beautiful melody it's one of those songs that that could have worked really well on like i said when winter comes like the early mccartney albums mccartney ram wildlife you know red rose speedway or the white album Seize the day. It's interesting what you said there, Alan, about the descending chords in the song, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. Um, everybody's pointing out the fact that it's, it sounds the most beatly of all the songs on, on this album. And I didn't hear that. But when you think about it, the descending chords remind you a bit of Hello, Goodbye, mm-hmm. if you think about it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when winter comes is priceless. You know, it, it's vintage Paul. Give me a whole album of that, please, any day. <laughs> you know, I'd love mm-hmm. to just put together, I've done it on my show on every little thing, just acoustic Paul. And that would work so well on those early McCartney albums. So really, when you get down to it, deep down is a little bit of a disappointment because in terms of composition, there isn't much there. But I love the whole sound of it, especially that organ that you hear throughout it really works mm-hmm. well. And um, and like I said, uh, Sliden, I just wish the vocals were more up front. But other than that, I love the whole album. It's very gratifying from start to finish. And uh, I do feel like it's more of a complete album, more so than the first McCartney album or McCartney 2. You know, there are songs on McCartney 2 that I, I felt he could have worked on a little bit more compositionally. But it, this could be the most gratifying of the three DIY albums, but it's still too soon to tell because I've only had this, you know, for a few days compared to 50 years of appreciating McCartney and 40 years of appreciating McCartney, too. But otherwise, that's kind of how I feel about it. Yeah. The thing about, um, you know, whether it's the best of the three, I think there's such three different albums that there's almost no point in trying to force them into being a a trilogy and where you have to pick the best of, of the three, because, um, you know, if you think about it, there's nothing on here that will wipe away. Maybe I'm amazed as, you know, an incredible McCartney solo song, which the first one has, I doubt there's anything that could be quite the hit that coming up was coming up is not one of my favorite McCartney things, but, you know, I have to acknowledge that it's apparently, a lot of other people's favorite McCartney, or at least it was big in its time. There's nothing on here that, I mean, he seems to even be thinking of putting out as a single. I mean, he did the video for Find My Way and for When Winter Comes, but nothing seems to be being promoted as a single of any kind. Well, the fact that Find My Way, the video was the first one, and they made a big deal of it, that Chris Rock was going to premiere it, makes you think that that's the one that they would highlight first. But, um, right. you know, a lot of what you said, I, I agree and disagree with about maybe I'm amazed. So much of our feelings about these songs is because they came out when they did. 
You know, it's 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 kind of hard to envision this. But if McCartney three had come out as the first McCartney album in 1970, you've had you would have had 50 years to enjoy the album and have a different experience with that. And who's to say that if the first McCartney album really came out now, that you would like the songs on there as much, you know? Mm. So I know what you're saying. Maybe I'm amazed is now this big classic McCartney song. A lot of people point to it as possibly his best in his solo career, but a lot of it is because of when it came out. You know, I do feel that way. And same thing with coming up. A lot of it is because of the time when it came out and people have had all these years to appreciate it compared to something that's brand new that it's it's too difficult to judge so soon as a lasting mm -hmm. piece of music yeah okay you know so would any of you like to give this album a grade based on yeah. uh, a scale of one to ten all right darren what do you think i think i initially thought of it as a six and somebody asked me this the other day and i thought six and a half so i'm ready to bump that up and I would say it's a seven right now for me. I don't know if it, would, it could go a little higher. Again, a few more listens. One thing that has frustrated me about this has actually nothing to do with the music. It has to do with the fact that here we are now, not quite a week after the album's release. But mm. I still am waiting for the majority of the copies that I ordered to arrive, which has kind of taken a little bit kind of slowed my complete digestion of the album down. The first thing I got were the cassettes from Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and late, and now we're at the Christmas rush, and I'm sure a lot of folks can relate to this. You begin to get all your packages that you've ordered for gifts and whatnot coming uh, in the door. And late last night, I received, and I even haven't had a chance to open it, what I think is the Barnes & Noble vinyl, the Target CDs, and I think the Japanese CD I ordered, but I haven't had, you know, there hasn't been any still so much I'm waiting on, which has sort of slowed me down with this uh, with this album. But uh, anyway, as for the, you know, the actual music, what counts, everything in there, it gets a seven for me right now. And again, like I said earlier, I think it's considerably better than new. Uh, it's a more substantial and better album than Egypt Station. Uh, I don't know how far back I'd go. I don't. I don't know. It's really too soon to tell. Yeah, you know? I, it's still. I like, I really like memory almost full a lot. So I wouldn't go that far back. But it's if if there's such a thing, it it, it sounds like I expected. Yet at the same time, it's not what I expected from him. Uh, but it really makes me want to tell him, you know, after Christmas, come on. Get back in the studio and do more because you're on to something here with the <laughs> album. Right. Yeah. It's so it's so that. hard to judge after just a few days. And, you know, it's a great feeling to see that amongst his fans that when a new album comes out, everyone's all excited and they can't wait to talk about it. But sometimes, and this is part of the trappings of social media, you know, I'm not a big fan of first impressions. And people open up their mouths and they say how they feel when they've, barely listen beyond you know a few times to the album and your feelings could change with more listens and uh like we this is now um five days since its release and our impressions could change in the next few days as we hear it more and more i always kind of feel like you should listen to the album at least 10 times <laughs> before you review it and then you need to distance yourself for a while and go back to it. And then what you feel then is is much more accurate to how you really feel about the album. And then again, years later, your opinions could change. But, you know, everybody wants to jump, <laughs> jump on board and say how they feel so quickly. But albums need a while to digest. I just don't believe some people can say how they feel after a few listens. That's just me. But anyway... Enough of my yakking, Alan. Yeah, I think it would be hard to grade. I, I don't. I, I never, uh, you know, was much for the star ratings or the thumbs up down kind of thing. Um, but here's the thing: there's usually something on a McCartney album that I actively dislike. So if you look at, say, Flowers, which is absolutely one of my favorite McCartney albums. It has the dreaded Oué Le Soleil. It's dreaded to you. 
<laughs> it's dreaded to me. But you know what? On this album, nothing is dreaded to me. So, but I don't know that I would say that it's a better album than Flowers in the Dirt. You see, you see the dilemma here. I mean, sure. if I were to grade Flowers in the Dirt as a nine, uh, do I have to, do I grade this as a 10 because it doesn't have anything like Oues Le Soleil on it? Or do I grade it as a seven because it also doesn't have my brave face and, you know, the Elvis Costello things and, you know, some of the other things that I liked on that album, especially. I don't know. It's really hard to do. I, I, I would give it at least a nine. Um, I think that, you know, given that track for track, uh, I like it. I mean, you know, some tracks more than others, but still nothing I really dislike on it. Uh, that would have to be a, a, a pretty high grade. Oh, sure. So, well, like I just said, it's very difficult to do this. To me, it should just be based on how much you like it. Not so much compared mm -hmm. to another album and what you would grade that album. And it's not, it's not an easy thing to do. You know, for me, I would give this album at this moment a nine. And a lot of that all mm -hmm. comes down to, you know, when I play it, am I ready for deep, deep feeling? Am I ready for an eight minute song? I was saying in the other podcast that, and I happen to like Driving Rain a lot as an album, but you're listening to the whole album, and then at the end, all of a sudden, you got 10 minutes of Rinse the Raindrops. And I don't mm. know if I want 10 minutes of that song. It, it's much more demanding of you to listen to a song for that long. So, mm. um, you know, when you're used to two, three minute songs, as tracks two through five are on McCartney 3, and then all of a sudden, you've got an eight minute song. You know, if I'm in the mood for it, like I said, it, there's there's nothing like it. And, um, you know, track for track, I really do enjoy this album. And I'm not going to compare it to McCartney or McCartney 2. It's way too soon to do that. And it's kind of funny. I was thinking about, you know, if you can compile tracks from 1, 2, and 3, what would you pick? But, you know, the production's different on all three. You know, yeah. you could tell from each one where they belong. Although... You know, when winter comes, could have fit on McCartney, the first one. But um, mm -hmm. you know, you'd probably feel that it was it would be somewhat erratic if you mixed all three of them together, because they're all so different in their own way and special in their own way. So yeah, but I would give this album a nine for now. You know, if I were going to juggle tracks around between albums, I, I, I would avoid the whole McCartney one two three thing and put um, when winter comes right on Ram. It seems to fit for me thematically on Ram. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. It could have fit on the first McCartney album. Maybe. All those acoustic songs, even, you know, going into um, something like uh, Mamunia. <laughs> I mean, that, that mm -hmm. fits the same. You, you're going into Ben on the Run there, but even still, that acoustic McCartney, Mama's Little Girl, you know, it's, it's uh, right. Heart of the Country, all that stuff, the stuff on the first McCartney album, Every Night. Man Who Was Lonely, Junk, those songs. That all fits. All right. So before we go, why don't we tell the folks what we've got cooking for each other and how we can get in touch with us. So why don't we start with Alan? Okay. I'm pretty easy. You just go on Facebook. It's either in, and you can find me either as Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. For all of us, you can, you can contact uh us at our show email address, which is ready, one word, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. And we have a Twitter feed at things we said fab. Um, on Facebook, we also have, a, as a show, we have a couple of pages. One is just things we said today, the other is things we said today, Beatles radio fans. And uh, that about does it. You can get all of us one way or another at most of those things. And on our YouTube page, please, please, please subscribe. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren, how's about you? All right. You can find me on Facebook. I have two pages. Uh, you could uh, send me a friend request to my main page, Darren DeVivo, but there's also Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ, Beatles podcaster, writer. Uh, just click like on that one. Uh, if you want to email me, email me at WFUV, uh, and it's my name spelled out, Darren DeVivo, that's D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O, at 
WFUV.org. I'm away from WFUV for the Christmas and New Year's holiday, and we'll return to the airwaves on uh, Monday night, January 4th uh, at 10 p.m. Monday through Thursday nights, I'm on 10 to midnight, uh, and on Saturdays, it's uh, 1 to 4 in the afternoon. And WFUV is at 90.7 FM in New York City. Or you can stream us anywhere in the world at WFUV.org or download our app. And be sure if you write to Darren that you send him some hearts and just uh, let him know how glad we all are that he's on the mend. Even if you're not glad that I'm on the mend, feel free to tell me that. Okay, as for myself, you can reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net, and you could friend me on my Facebook page at Ken Michaels. Uh, on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, you will find a Beatles trivia page, and every single week, you could win one of 10 great prizes. The trivia question this week is a very timely one, which has to do with the start of the dreaded season of winter. So if you can, go to the website, go to the Beatles Trivia and Games page, play along with it, and you could win a great prize like a book, a CD, or a DVD. I have a brand new YouTube page, Ken Michaels Radio, and my most recent interview on there was Fred Velez, who's a good friend to many in the Beatle community. He's known as being a monkeys expert, the group, the monkeys, that is. And a few years ago, Fred put out a book called A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You. He's got a new one. His follow-up, a very clever title, A Little Bit Me, A Little Bit You, Too. And um, so I do an interview with him on uh, my YouTube page, which is all about the Monkees and Beatles connections, and do a lot of talk about the Monkees music and all the great songwriters in particular that uh, mm -hmm. wrote material for the Monkees. Also, I appeared on Sam Wiles' Paul McCartney podcast called Paul or Nothing, and we had a conversation on what are our top three reasons why we love and admire Paul, and at the same time, our top three criticisms of Paul. And you can find that online, as well as another podcast that I was on, which has such a great title, almost as good as our titles, Pods Like Us. Oh, do I love that title. And it's hosted by Marv Quibble. And this is a podcast show about other podcasts. And Tom Hunyadi from Talk More Talk and the Two Legs podcast joined me for this particular show. And we talked about uh, Talk More Talk and our feelings about podcasts in general. And as this is Christmas season, we all listed our favorite Christmas songs on the show. So look that up, Pods Like Us by uh, Martin Quibble. Q-U-I-B-E-L-L. -L. And uh, it's a really fun show. Get to find out what our favorite Christmas songs are. You would never in a million years guess what my top two would be. I'm not even going to give it away here on this show. But uh, if you can, check out that show, Pods Like Us. Ain't nobody that pods like us, I think. Hmm. Anyway, so this has been great, talking about McCartney 3 and all the latest news. And I have a feeling our next uh, show is going to have a much shorter newscast. But uh, <laughs> it sure is fun to talk about all that's going on. And we are so grateful that uh, McCartney 3 and this new Ringo song just came out. And as this is our last show for 2020, uh, we have, uh, it looks like, so much to look forward to next year. We'll have to dig very, very deep into our pockets because it looks like we'll have a Plastic on All Band box set, an All Things Must Pass box set, the five-song EP from Ringo. Also, uh, well, depending upon the pandemic, will there be a stage production of It's a Wonderful Life? If there is, we'll probably get a soundtrack for that. There'll also be the Get Back film, hopefully in theaters, a Let It Be box set, the original Let It Be, being remastered for DVD and Blu-ray. And who knows if there'll be another archive release from Paul. So just for that alone, that's going to be plenty there to keep us busy. 
We're already getting yeah. phone calls for yeah. some of those releases right here on the show as we speak. <laughs> so before we end our show, we each have something we want to tell you from the heart. We'll start with Darren. I want to thank those of you who uh, sent the birthday cards and greetings and Christmas cards and greetings and and those of you who paid the subscription as well. Happy Crimble, everyone. Merry New Year. Thank you so much for spending 2020 with us. Here's to a better 2021. Ding dong, ding dong. I want to be Santa Claus. Enjoy your holidays and we'll see you in 2021. Thank you, Darren. We'll phone you. We'll phone you. <laughs> <laughs> I know Alan was ready to say that, but I stole it from him. Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Just wish the people. <laughs> I have a new book, it says here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so have a happy holiday, have a great new year, um, and take it from there. And uh, as for me, I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for making this uh, year so special for us, continuing with this podcast, which we started way back in 2012. Thank you for being there. You've been loyal, haven't you? And uh, <laughs> we do appreciate that. Thanks for all of your support, and here's wishing you all the very best for 2021. Anything would be better considering what happened around the world with this pandemic. Let's hope that that will all be resolved as soon as possible. And uh, here's wishing you all a very healthy and happy new year. Matches. Candles. Matches. <laughs> Candles. And we'll see you all. Same time next year. Uh, I have to do Christmas. All right, that's good. So, okay. So uh, this, this so, is the longest let's show, see. I think. Two, and two and a half. hours and two thirty one thirty eight. It's like <laughs> God. our version of deep, deep feeling. Yes. <laughs>